I, I did not talk to the worship team um, to ask them to play any particular songs, but um, when I heard you start Break Every Chain, I just started gushing. It's one of my favorites. And I have been looking so forward to speaking this summer. I've been praying for it for months. And I know God is going to do something amazing and miraculous here today in my life and in your life, but only if you are expectant. So I'm going to ask you this morning if you would come expecting, expecting something, expecting miraculous. Not for me. I'm just done. But I serve a God who brings the miraculous who breaks every chain, who heals the blind. Well, uh, tell you a little bit about myself and uh, so you can get to know me. Um, And honestly, I'm not going to go big into my details because I think God's word is going to be pretty heavy and and God's word's authority is going to carry us this morning. Um, But I have been uh, an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God since 2017. Prior to that, I served as a children's pastor and youth pastor for about 12 years. Uh, Six years in that, I also served in an amazing ministry called Rock the Sound. And Rock the Sound was a large-scale Christian concert ministry where we would bring artists like David Crowder, Third Day, Jeremy Camp, uh, and have outreach concerts anywhere from Boston down to New York City. And we started to actually center more around that New York City area and around Long Island Sound. And that's why the ministry was called Rock the Sound. We were bringing the rock to Long Island Sound. Um, That was an amazing path. But the amazing part is how some of that actually started here. I didn't know it until I stepped foot in this. This is the first time I have been in Enfield Square since 2001. It is. And it, you've been here you, that long? I grew up in Enfield. Can you tell me, like, next door to this store? Or somewhere, it might even have been here. American, American Eagle might have expanded. But there was a music store called Record Town, which then became FYE. It was a cross. So um, I was here because uh, a a famous national known band was having a CD release party. And I was part of the management team for that music company. And in that, we actually had lines and and press, and it was a big deal to have this national band here uh, who said this was like their hometown. And uh, there was Record Town, or FYE, and then uh, WCCC, Connecticut's Hard Rock Station, right, was representing it. And that was all happening, and that all happened, like, you know, right here in, in Enfield Square. And now, 20 years later, WCCC is K Love, and New Life Church is in Enfield Square. Wow! Is God amazing and powerful? There are changes taking place in New England, and I am just completely amazed and moved by this. Um, So uh, I'll get into a little bit more about how that change took place, how I'm now here preaching in front of you instead of working for a record store. Because I believe the change that happened, the things that helped me make that happen, are something that God going, God's going to be offering you today as well. Um, I met Pastor Dave uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, Dave was scheduled to go on a trip to Peru. And uh, uh, it was uh, really cool. Um, he was going with a group of pastors down there, and they were going to be doing a video skit, uh, and they were exploring the possibility of maybe expanding, and pastors maybe bringing their own congregations their own team is back to Peru. About 10 days before the trip, one of the other pastors had something take place and they could not go any longer. 
and there was an open door, there was an open seat. They couldn't refund the tickets. And so my boss, the superintendent, uh, Nick Fatato, looked at me and said, Don, you're going to Peru. Now, the reason why he had me go there is I'm part of the communications team for the network office. And uh, I have a particular set of skills. Um, and uh, not the Liam Neeson kind, but uh, my particular set of skills are more like uh, movie making and uh, video work and graphic arts design. And uh, so they wanted me to go down there and capture footage and be able to share the story of what was going on there. Now, you're going to see this video. I'm going to show you so you can see what it is that I do now. And, uh, but this video was actually designed for pastors to see what was going on when we were bringing other pastors down to uh, take a look at Peru. And uh, you're going to get a little glimpse of, uh, of D Pastor Dave. That was a, uh, uh, an amazing trip, and uh, we actually saw uh, miracles take place there. It was, it was astounding. And as a person who using cameras and video and... Um, you know, I, I, was, I kept going, I was frustrated because I didn't have two more heads and four more arms and more cameras to be able to shoot because it just seemed like every direction you turned, you know, there was something amazing to shoot video of and tell more of the story. Um, we're now living, okay, I'm just gonna do it this way. Who has a camera with you right now? It's on your phone, right? Yeah. So the, the amount of people who are carrying cameras and videotaping things and experiencing that, uh, I, don't, I hate bringing it up, but uh, last week there was the assassination attempt. And there has never been an event like that that has had so much amateur footage available to see what took place because of how many people were using cameras. I love using cameras for events, and sometimes I feel really weird when I'm at an event and I don't have that because that's how I, ex I tend to experience things that way. But there's a problem when we start using cameras, and that is we get our eyes in the viewfinder, right? Get our eyes in the viewfinder or on that screen, and quite often we miss what's going on around us, to the left, to the right, above us and below us. And so that's one of the most frustrating things for a camera person is, is the things that we miss and we don't know what we missed, right? Um, my favorite place, or my wife's favorite place, uh, I've been married for 37 years. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. So, um, my wife has made it easy. I'm sure I've made it difficult. Uh, my wife is uh, amazing. I actually have, um, we have four adult children. Well, adultish, is that a word? <laughs> adultish words? Um, and uh, our, our youngest ni is 19, uh, he just got his first job, and so we're really excited about that. It's really fun um, to actually have him not be in the house, and uh, it's, uh, it's cool. I, I got to tell you, I was pretty good. I felt like I was pretty good and pretty prepared for being a parent for, you know, younger kids and, and stuff. I, why did I think that when they hit 18, 19, I was going to be done, right? <laughs> What was I thinking? I'm just telling you, if, if you've got young kids, that job does not end, I'm sorry. You know? And there is no manual for parenting adults. What there is is there's a lot of, channel, or a lot of like, uh, videos on YouTube of people venting, you know? uh, but there's no instructions. How do you raise, how do you, how do you parent adults? Okay. Uh, my wife is amazing. She, um, we met when we were in Bible school uh, in Berkshire, uh, in the Berkshires, and then we finished our schooling in New Jersey. She actually majored to be L-Ed, and so she went and she was an elementary school teacher for a while, both in a private school and then later in public schools. Um, and then later on, she, uh, has, uh, she homeschooled our kids. I want to say that I helped, and, and I mean, I kind of did. I helped set up the software, but really she was the, 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 the like the brains behind it, and she did a phenomenal job in my estimation. And now my wife, um, she's, uh, she's working for Chick-fil-A down in North Haven, and she's been there for almost about, uh, I, I guess we're going probably eight years now. And uh, she is, um, this is how amazing my wife is. God started telling her that she needed to learn Chinese. Why? 
And if that doesn't scare, I mean, that, that scares me. I'm like, what does that mean for us, right? Are we going to China? I don't, what? Anyways, um, so she felt led to do so. And so she's been self-studying, self-learning through apps and books. And she watches Chinese television sh shows. She, she listens to Chinese music. And, uh, and so she's, uh, yeah, so she's self-taught both learning like to hear, listen, and speak, and then also to be able to read it. And uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and uh, it's really funny because uh, at one point, um, you know, the phrases that you learn when you're learning a new language, I don't understand why they teach certain phrases. So one of the phrases that she taught me was, was to be able to say, your child is under the table. <laughs> I can't remember how to say it now. And the reason I can't remember how to say it now is because, well, let's just say, there's a restaurant I'm not allowed to go to anymore. I told the waitress that her child was under the table. <laughs> not a good look. All right. Uh, but um, if you know my wife, one of the things about her is that uh, she, she loves, um, one of her favorite places in the, in the world is a place called Mackinac Island. Um, I, okay, pop quiz. What state in the contiguous United States has the most amount of shoreline? Florida, maybe? What was another guess? Maine? Anybody else? Who said Michigan? Oh, you, you. She's a special person. Michigan. Michigan is two peninsulas. Let me see if I can remember how to do this correctly. Yeah, okay. There we go. Michigan is made up of two peninsulas, the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula, and they're surrounded by the Great Lakes. They have more shoreline, more sandy beaches than any other state, and you would never expect it because it's way up north and it's in the center of the, of the country. It's not on any of the, uh, the coasts, right? But it has the most amount of shoreline, and where the two peninsulas meet, there is an island called Mackinac Island. And Mackinac Island is pretty famous because they don't allow any kind of motorized vehicles. So transportation of people and goods and things are either done on bicycle or horse-drawn carriages. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So here's a picture of one of those horse-drawn carriages. And uh, if you know my wife, my, my wife loves rugged shoreline. She loves bicycles. She loves horses. So like, this is like her, her like slice of heaven on earth is going to uh, Mackinac Island. But when you're on Mackinac Island, you're going to notice something when you see these horses. The horses are wearing something on the sides of their eyes. We call them blinders. In, in, in England, they tend to call them blinkers. I don't, I, they don't blink, but they call anyways, blinders, horse blinders. And they're designed to limit the vision of the horse to allow to be able to prevent them from being distracted prevent them from being, help them to be able to stay focused and not get distracted or scared and it makes them more manageable church it's my contention this morning that our church the american church and our followers our disciples of jesus too many of us myself included have allowed ourselves to be fitted with blinders. And there are aspects of our spiritual life that we are not seeing, either willfully or just through negligence. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at today's text, which is John chapter 9. And I have a buddy who's going to help me out. Let's give a big hand for our friend John. John is going to help be my scripture reader today. All right. You ready, John? Do you want to read it from here or do you want to read from where are you going to read it from? Oh, uh, what works for you? I think I'm going to read it from here. Okay. So, uh, well, that means you're going to know where I'm going to interrupt you. That's going to remove the fun. All right. That's okay. We'll deal I'll, with it. I'll pretend like I'm going to keep talking. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Don't let them, don't let them know. Okay. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, 
Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must carry out the tasks assigned to assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Yes, then, good, yeah, good, bye. thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, stay here. So, um, I just want to set the stage for a second. In, in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, um, Jesus is kind of at the peak of his earthly ministry. He's been ministering with his disciples, and uh, they are now, they, they're in Jerusalem, and they're still in the Jerusalem area because they just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a celebration harking back to the days when uh, the Hebrew people were fleeing Egypt and God provided for them in the desert. And so they celebrate by, um, they get together and they, they stay in tents, these, their own tabernacles, and they, they can only eat in a tabernacle for those like seven days. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, the, the reason why it's important to know that they were just there is in chapter nine, or in chapter eight, Jesus had declared himself, he had spoken boldly saying, I am the light of the world. It was very bold and it got some of the, the, the church and religious leaders a little upset with him saying that. It was, a, it was a declaration. Um, and also, just so you understand, um, about four, four months from this moment, Jesus is going to be crucified, died, and then resurrect, all right, on Easter. Um, so now you know the timeline. In that discussion, in this section here, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Make no mistake about this. When we sin, sin has consequences. And although God forgives us our sin if we repent and we ask Jesus to wash us clean, doesn't always mean that the consequences go away, does it? Sometimes we still have to face those consequences. God will walk us through this. But Jesus says that's not the situation here. This guy's not blind because his parents sinned. He's not blind because of his sin. Jesus says he's blind because something miraculous is going to happen and I'm going to be revealed. And we have to remember, we're so quick sometimes when bad stuff happens to blame it on sin. Maybe we're more so quick to do that when it's happening to somebody else. And we gotta be really careful about that, right? My muffler had to be replaced on my car because it had a rust hole on it, right? It got rust, it got water on it. Bad stuff sometimes happens. We live in a broken world. Not everything is the cause of, of sin, right? I don't think the muffler broke because I sinned. So, um, I mean, I suppose I didn't wash the muffler off, I don't know, but, um, but, but really, I, I, we have to remember that Jesus also tells us in the book of Matthew that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That's all I'm saying, church. Just, just let's be careful about casting sin out on other people. It's not, nobody here, me included, has the spiritual gift of telling other people their sin, right? That's, that's not there. All right. I'll continue. Sure? Yep. All right. I then he you. spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Great. Does that seem weird to anybody? It does. It does. Good. <laughs> it seems weird. I mean, Jesus didn't just go and say, thou was healed right? He, he spits into mud. He spits into dirt, makes mud, and then he takes this mud and he puts it on the, the spaces where the man's eyes were or should have been. Does anybody see anything else in that that maybe resembles something biblical? It calls back to something that maybe you've read or you... you it, what do you think? Does it, does it remind you of anything? 
Yeah, what's it remind you of? Uh, it reminds me of a couple things. Okay. Um, for one, it reminds me that you know God created us out of the dust of the ground. That's ex uh, I think that's exactly it. What's the other one? Uh, the other one would be. No, you're wrong. Okay. No. What was the other one? What's the other one, John? Um, the other is just, it just reminds me that, you know, um, him washing away what's wrong is almost like him washing our sins away. Oh, that's good too. Yeah, um, actually in the second book of Genesis, um, God, they refer to God, Moses tells us that when God made man, he formed him out of the dust, out of the dirt, right? So I think what we're seeing here is Jesus doing something, a creative action, which in, his, in its own way kind of spells out, says, you know, I too am creator, right? So, so, so I think that's what, that's what it reminds me of. All right, let's keep going. I'm glad we didn't do it for real. That would have been a little gross. Yeah, that would have been bad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, okay. His, his neighbors and others knew him as a blind beggar, asked each other, who knew him as a blind beggar, asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said no. He just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Okay, hold on a second, John. Okay, it's important to understand this. Not only does this blind man not know, like, where Jesus is, he doesn't even know what Jesus looks like yet. Because when he was with Jesus and Jesus put the mud on his eyes, he could not see. And then Jesus sends him to the pool of Siloam to go wash. So he, hasn't even, he doesn't even know what Jesus looks like. He knows what he hears, what he sounds like. He doesn't know what he looks like. I think that's, 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 that's pretty interesting. Okay, I, I got to tell you that um, one of the things, uh, trying to refer to the man, I wish, I wish the Bible told us his name. Now, we don't know his name because the story, like he's not supposed to be, you know, the hero of the story, although he has some heroic moments. The focus is on Jesus. But you know what? For, for, for today, all right, humor me. Um, the word uh, chaza. Can you say, everybody say chaza? Chaza. Nice, got that. Chaza. All right. Uh, that is Hebrew, and it means vision. All right. And uh, when so, but it's not like like it really is like oh look, he had a vision. That's what that that word means. Um, when we write it in English. We use English letters. We actually started out with C H A Z Z A H. All right. So like, but uh, but I, I just today. What do you think? Can we call him Chaz? I'm good with it. Great. So from now on, for the rest of the story, <laughs> how amazing is it going to be when we get to heaven and the guy goes, "I am Chaz." Right. <laughs> all right. So we're gonna call we're gonna call him Chaz for the rest of the morning. Okay. So so uh, go ahead. Tell us what happens next with Chaz. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so they told him. So he told them, He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees asked again, questioned question the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man that the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. Okay. I love this part of the story. This is dumb. It's dumb to love this part of the story. I'm going to come over here for a second. So um, I, I, I love this part of the story because I, I, feel, I find it to be so real. The Bible and its narratives, especially in the, the gospel message, is incredible because it shares details that if you were making this stuff up, you wouldn't include. 
right? You would never say, all right, and then these guys, the, the Pharisees, right? So, like, they, uh, they, they're, they're upset about Jesus, and so, uh, so they, they asked the guy, you know, hey, how did, they asked Chaz, how, 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 how did you get healed? You know, and, uh, and then they don't like the answer, so they're like, well, we're going to go talk to your parents, right? Like, I, I, I just don't think that that's something that you would make up. I think it shows the, the validity, the truth of this story. So they go and they talk to the parents, right? And, uh, well, let's see what happens. They asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would, would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why did, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become disciples too? Oh, man, this guy kills me. Chaz is funny, right? Chaz has got a sense of humor, and he's also got a little bit of rage. Think about this. This young man was born blind. He could not see anything. This is, th there's, there's no, his only life is going to be sitting, being placed where somebody puts him, and he's going to be begging. He's not going to get married. He's not going to have kids. He's got no livelihood except for the giving of people and begging on the street. And when his parents die, What's going to happen to him? Are there people going to take care of him? The life expectancy of somebody who was born blind like that is pretty short. And it is a miserable, miserable existence. And what's worse, at this time, there is no recorded Jewish history of anybody being healed from being blind at birth. Never before. But yet this guy was praying and asking his God for a miracle. He wasn't allowed to be inside the temple because of his, the, the blindness. They thought that there was sin, so he wasn't, in, wasn't allowed to be in the synagogue, but he was able to stay outside and listen, right? He would pray and pray and pray and then all of a sudden comes Jesus Jesus sees him Jesus mixes up the mud puts it on him tells him to go to Siloam he washes it off and he can see how, ama how amazing is that how life changing is that and then the religious leaders of his own community Instead of celebrating and saying, look at this life God has given him. Thank you, God. They're all concerned about who did this, how did he do it. And you know why? Because it didn't come from them. Because it didn't come from them. But Chaz has that building up in him, right? And when they keep asking him and keep questioning him, he's like, why do you keep asking? Why do you keep asking? Oh, is it because you want to become a disciple of his too? He says too. Why? Because Chaz is becoming a disciple of Jesus, of the one that set him free, of the one that healed him, the one that gave him, said, said I, I was blind, but now I see. And what does he see? He sees the light of the world. All right, 
So Chaz has got a little chops here, and he kind of like throws that back in their face. What happens with those, uh, those Pharisees? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Yeah, it had never been done before. Never been done before. And, and there he, Chaz says it himself. It's never been done before, but look what happened, right? Now, later on, um, Jesus heals in uh, other Gospels. He heals two more people. But this appears to have been the very first time that, that, that Jesus healed somebody from, from being blind. All right, let's keep going. Oh, the... Uh, you were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. And I just want to say that like, when he gets thrown out of the synagogue, that's not like being thrown out of a store or tossed out of a friend's house because you stayed too late. It's, he's, it's like excommunication, but it's not just excommunication from the church. You've got to remember that in, in Jewish family history, like in that culture, the, the, their faith and their life and their business, everything is all intertwined. You, could no longer, you couldn't do business. So even though this guy now can see, he can't be in the synagogue, he can't go to temple, he can't be in business with somebody, he can't get a job with somebody because he's out. He's been, like, he's thrown out now, right? So that, that's, that's a big deal. And it's one of the reasons why the parents actually said to him, go ask him, because if they answered, they were going to get kicked out and they were afraid. They didn't want to get kicked out for that. So, all right. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. He gets to see Jesus with his new eyes. Jesus comes to him, and he's been hoping. He doesn't know if he's ever going to see the guy that did this. And there he is, in the moment of time where he's feeling cast out. Here comes Jesus, the one who reaches out to the outcasts. Go ahead. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby him heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Let's give John a big round of applause. Thanks for helping. And let's definitely keep that up there. We start with Jesus in the previous chapter. He says he is the light of the world. Makes that claim. Then we get to chapter 8, and he starts off by healing Chaz. He gives him new eyes so that he can see. And all of a sudden, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, get really upset about this, completely out of whack, right? And they're so upset because it's not them. They're attacking anybody who has anything to do with this and declares that Jesus is special, says that maybe Jesus is the Messiah, maybe Jesus is more than just a, a, a teacher, more than just a rabbi. And they're really upset about this. Jesus switches from being the one who heals the blind physically to now talking about the bigger spiritual picture. He's saying that he came to be the light of the world. He came so that he might heal people who were blind, who could not see the light of the world. But at the same time, he says that, oh, it's not up there, it's the other one. Um, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. 
Because even though those Pharisees were religious leaders, they were blind to being able to see that light of the world that Jesus was. If you are a disciple of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've had that experience where Jesus opened up your eyes and you experienced him as the light of the world, as the light of your world, your life should have been changed and impacted and set on a different course than it ever was before. But what I said earlier this morning is that I believe that in our American churches and very likely here in New Life as well because I believe that God gave me this message to speak here, to start here, that sometimes we ourselves who have been Chaz, who have been a follower of Jesus, can still sometimes develop spaces, places, things that are making us blind to see. And I have two main areas that I want to talk about. The first one is being blind to the needs of others. Now, let's face it. New Life Church is not blind to the needs of others. You guys are helping out with the food bank. You have VBS. You have other outreaches that are taking place. New Life Church is not blind to the needs of others. And I am sure that so many of you participate in that, and that is great. How many of you, how many of us know the needs of our neighbor? Know the needs of the people whose yard is like, we're, right, walk across our yard and there's our neighbor's house? How many of us don't know our neighbors' names? Way too many of us. I think that we have become blind to those needy. In the late 70s, early 80s, there was a guy named Douglas Adams who started and he helped write a radio show called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he took those scripts and he turned them into a series of books, The Hitchhiker's of the Universe, or Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Um, and uh, it's, it's a multiple series. And in it, he created a lot of fantastical items, things that, that are futuristic. One of the things he talks about is, can we show the picture of the, uh, the sunglasses? The Jew Jantu 200 Super Chromatic Peril Sensitive sunglasses. Now, these sunglasses were marketed, supposedly, to those that needed to have to develop a sense of calm when they came across moments of crisis or danger or peril. And the way the glasses work is this. You would put them on, and at the first sign of any danger that might happen to you, the glasses become completely dark, <laughs> giving the viewer a calm sense of attitude because they can't see the danger that's coming towards them. The idea that what you can't see can't hurt you. Well, we know that's not true. Although I will tell you that my wife was very disappointed when she found that they don't actually exist because she was looking for a pair for when she rides with me on, on 91. <laughs> so uh, she was really hoping that and that they, they, they don't exist, sorry. But unfortunately for us, spiritually, I think a lot of us are wearing these glasses. Too many of us, the second part that, that happens where I think that we're blind as, as Christian followers of Jesus is that, um, and it really stuns us, we become blind to the things that God has called us personally to do. Or maybe we become blind to the things that God has called us to not do. How can you tell if that's you? If you're telling me that I pray, I'm just not hearing from God. God's not really talking to me. 
that could be a sign. It could be a sign that God did talk to you, but you didn't listen. Another thing could be like this. In your time when you're talking to God, right, and you're like praying to him, like a telephone call, and you give him all the list of the things you need, all right, yep, and take care of my kids, uh, don't forget I need a raise, all right, thanks, amen. And then you hang up really fast, all right, because if you give him time or space, he might actually tell you something and you're afraid of what he's going to tell you. This is a bad spot to be in. This is a really bad spot to be in. Well, it can be a really bad spot to be in. It can be a bad spot to be in because we are called, Jesus says he is the vine and we are the branches. And as branches, we are called to bear much fruit. How much fruit do, do non-growing, any gardeners here? Anybody have a garden this summer? How much fruit grows on uh, vines that aren't growing? None, right? Yeah, none. Uh, 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 only growing vines grow fruit. And we can't grow unless we're in communication with God and we're doing the things he's asked us to do. We stop growing the moment we stop listening to him. And that's both if he's told us to do something and we're not doing it, or if he's told us to stop doing something and we're not doing it, or we, we keep doing it. We're now... We, th we think we're plateaued. We're like, I'll just stay like this. It's okay. I don't have to grow. I, I can just stay like this. And we do it mostly because we're comfortable, because we're afraid of change. We hate change. And so we would rather be like this than perhaps have that change that might change that trajectory in our lives. And all of a sudden, boom. We're afraid it might go like this, but mostly we're even afraid if it goes like this because it's still going to mean work, change, difference. And that's not what we want. So I was here in 2001 working for a, a music company, uh, working for a retail establishment. I managed multiple locations, and so I was brought in because I was experienced with events and things. And so I, I was part of that team for the... Uh, the CD release party. Um, I knew there was change taking place because MP3s had been released. You guys know MP3s, right? I mean, I mean, before then, music, I mean, if you tried to rip a CD onto a computer, it would take half your hard drive just for one song. But when MP3s were designed, all of a sudden, music could be transported digitally, quickly, fastly. And I knew, being somebody who was technically advanced, that working for this music company was going to be short-lived. I explored looking at other options. I, I found myself trying to start a new financial business. And the truth is, as a follower of Jesus, um, the only way I was going to make money in, in, a, in the financial business is if I was chasing after people that already had money. And all I could do was keep trying to help people who had no money. And uh, you don't make money that way. Um, and so uh, I found myself painting post offices um, for a living. Um, I, I was my own, my own job, my own business. Uh, and then all of a sudden my wife tells me, hey, because we used to go to Soul Fest, which was up in uh, New Hampshire, and we would go there uh, every summer for our vacation, just hang out, hear the music and stuff. And we'd become friendly with a band called Apologetics, which is this really weird band. It's like a cross, yeah? It's like a cross between, um, it's like a cross between uh, Billy Graham and Weird Al Yankovic. They, 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 they take modern songs and they, they rework the lyrics so that they're completely biblical and biblical stories. It's hysterical, and they do it so well. It's not garbage. It's really good. So uh, uh, we'd become friends with him, and my wife said, the Holy Spirit is telling me we need to rent out the high school auditorium here in Cheshire, and we need to bring the band Apologetics in and have an outreach concert. Being the loving, supportive man of God and father and husband that I am, I said, are you crazy? you have any idea what that entails? 
you, the, the, the insurances alone, how much we would have to have, right? To, and I'm like, and, and like the high school is just going to let us rent there? There's no way. And so I, I, I thought, I polished that off and we were done. Whew. I avoided the change. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let my wife go. And six months later, she comes back and she goes, look, God's telling me we got to do this. It's there for us to do. And if we don't do it, we're going to be dropping out. We're going to be losing blessings that he has for us. So at this time, I said, well, you know what? All right, let's do this. We'll, take, we'll try. We'll take some steps. And we'll see how things go. If God is in this, this thing's going to be unstoppable. And this thing was unstoppable. There wasn't any issue that came up that we didn't have an answer for or a provision for within 24 hours. This thing, I, I couldn't have stopped it if I wanted to. I was visiting youth groups and talking to them about the band, and, and I was in all kinds. I was in, I was in liberal churches. I was in conservative churches. And, and uh, we were talking. I was making friends with, with youth pastors and pastors. And... Uh, uh, the, the, the one thing that we still had left to do was we needed, um, we didn't have enough money. We had spent all the money on the band. The, the, the uh, room was available for the date we needed. The, the high school was glad to do it. Um, why was that? The high school was glad to do it. It was crazy. Um, but I didn't have the money for the insurance, and so we just prayed about it. And then all of a sudden, the next day, I get a phone call from a lady from um, Youth for Christ in New Haven saying, hey, I, I have a need. I was wondering if we could talk. She comes in, we talk, and she's like, I need to have an event. And she goes, I was wondering if, if, if maybe we could pool together somehow. If there's something I have that you need that maybe, you know, we could work together, I could get the logo on your poster, and it would help me to be able to keep my charter, and, uh, and maybe we'd provide I'm like, well, we need event insurance. I completely have that. So now, as teamed up with, with Youth for Christ, we now have the insurance. This event comes up. It comes off. We have the, 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 the uh, high school holds 700 people. We had 626 people there. It was unbelievable. Um, we were pretty excited about it. And at that event, there were a couple other people who were starting another ministry, who were doing something with, a, with bigger bands. And the, the guy who was leading it up said, I was told this was impossible, that New England does not do this, that Connecticut does not do this, that you can't have a Christian music event like this, that it's not going to take place, that nobody's going to come, you're just going to lose money. He goes, but look, this is what, what God did, to you, did for you. Can you help us? So I pray and we connect and we start combining and I become part of this team that develops Rock the Sound. And for six months, all of, I mean, our, my, my life is completely different. I, 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 pretty soon I'm doing it full time. I'm not painting any longer, right? I, I start working in, in, in the, the kids' ministry in our church, and then soon um, the, the youth pastor steps away, and I, I, start, I actually end up um, uh, taking on that position as well. Um, all of this stuff happened. Oh, and my... My 19-year-old son, whose name is Jeremiah, um, he's adopted. And we got him because, because this lady attended that concert who was in need, and she was a broken person. And when, before she was a Christian, she was uh, abused and beaten and... Uh, She'd already lost the authority to have children with, so DCF had already taken her, or her children already away. She was an unfit mother. And this, and, and, but she had become a Christian through counseling. But right before she'd become a Christian, she had gotten pregnant. And so she had a baby on the way. She said, I have a chance to set this kid this baby up with a life that I wish I had had. That I would know Jesus when I'm young and not have to wait until for years and years and years to realize that I have worth, that I'd spent so many years being abused. 
would you consider adopting this child when this child is born? Jeremiah just turned 19, and uh, he's an amazing blessing. We need to stop being blind. We need to remove these blinders from our eyes. We need to see what is there that God has for us. Can you imagine if 20% of our churches would start working that way, would remove these blinders from us, would take the steps in faith that God's asking us to do. He's not going to ask you to do something that he's not going to work with you through, that he's not going to support you in. He's going to ask you to take part in a mission that he has, that he's already ordained. And all he's looking for is a yes. This morning we talked about blindness. We talked about physical blindness. We talked about spiritual blindness. How do we get rid of this blindness? The same way Jesus did it. We lay hands, we pray, and we ask God to heal us from that. I have full expectation that we're going to see some miracles this morning. That we're going to see some people healed with, from, from having eye problems but we're going to see some people being healed from having spiritual eye problems. So if you would, just take a minute. Let's be quiet. And if you haven't been letting God speak into your life, let's give him a moment to do that right now. Just say, God, my eyes are open. Show me. I'm listening.